Workforce Postal Service in the District of Columbia will now come to order. Welcome, uh, Ranking Member uh, Chaffetz and members of the subcommittee hearing, and all witnesses of those who are in, ten in attendance. Today's hearing will examine the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, drug, drug benefit, and the impact that the lack of pricing transparency has on the Office of Personnel Management's ability to evaluate the overall value of those benefits. The hearing will also discuss alternative pricing and contracting methods for the FEHBP's prescription drug benefit. The chair, the ranking member, and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. At this time, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the testimonies from Change to Win and the National Community Pharmacists Association be submitted for the record. Uh, hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, again, because of the irregularities on the, on the floor, we're, we're going to proceed with as many members as we have uh, available. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome all of our witnesses uh, and uh, the fellow members who will attend uh, eventually. Uh, as we examine this prescription drug benefit in the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program. I'd also like to thank all of today's witnesses for sharing their insight and expertise on this complex issue. Uh, I understand that several of you have come uh, from quite a distance to be here with us today, and I deeply appreciate your willingness to help the subcommittee gain a better understanding of how the FEHBP, the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program prescription drug benefit is structured and priced. Uh, the federal government is currently facing one of its largest policy issues to date, health care reform. Uh, this issue affects everyone, and many challenges must be addressed in the upcoming months to find the right solutions. Uh, many policymakers look to the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program as a model for providing health care. That's why it's important to ensure that the program is providing the best uh, quality in benefits at the best price. Uh, entitled... Federal Employees Health Benefit Program's Prescription Drug Benefits Deal or No Deal, we've called for this afternoon's hearing to examine the contracting method used to deliver prescription drugs to the 8 million federal employees, their dependents, annuitants, and members of Congress, and their families that are covered, covered under this program. Uh, considering that prescription drug costs make up close to 30 percent of the federal employees' health benefit program premiums, we need to do all we can to ensure that federal employees and the taxpayer are getting the best value for their dollar. Astonishingly, limited reviews or analyses have been performed on this increasingly expensive benefit, but that will change starting today. For the most part, the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program health plan uh, contract with pharmacy benefit managers to price and provide the pharmacy benefit to federal employee health benefit plan members. In contrast with other federal health programs, the federal employee health benefit plan does not regulate or negotiate drug pricing for its members. Instead, it relies on the competition among various carriers and uh, pharmacy benefit managers to keep prices low. However, as we will hear today, prices are not low. In fact, when comparing the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program drug prices to that of other federal programs, such as the VA and the Department of Defense, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Public Health Service 340B program, we will hear that along with the Medicare Part D, uh, FEHBP is paying substantially more for its drugs than the other federal programs. Now, some research even shows that Costco and Drugstore.com offer better prices for drugs than the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program that's in spite of the fact that uh, the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program has the buying power of, of 8 million uh, members. So that's especially troubling. In these economically challenging times, we shouldn't be asking federal employees and the American taxpayer to accept this. If the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan wants to remain a model for providing health benefits, legislative changes that allow for alternative prescription drug benefit contracting and pricing are in order. The key, the, the key question we hope to explore today is why are the federal government and therefore the taxpayers paying such different amounts for the same drug? And I'm not an expert on pharmaceutical pricing, but I have a hunch that the 
pharmaceutical industry charges what they can to make the largest profits. Uh, for the first six months of 2006, the 10 largest drug manufacturers enjo enjoyed profits of close to $40 billion. So do I think that the pharmaceutical industry could afford to charge lower prices for our federal employees? I, I certainly do. As chairman of the subcommittee, I am committed to providing the best benefits to our federal employees at the best price. And we in Congress have asked a lot of taxpayers in the last few months uh, to, to help us out with that, that very function. With that, we have a responsibility to make sure every dollar is spent, that is spent is, is necessary and is providing the greatest benefit. Again, I thank uh, all of those attend in attendance, and I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses. Um, normally, I would yield to Mr. Uh, Chaffetz. Uh, I will, of course, afford every courtesy to members as they arrive. So even though we may have to uh, skip forward in the proceedings, I will certainly recognize the ranking member and, and my other colleagues as they do arrive. Uh, <clears throat> it is the committee's policy that all witnesses uh, submitting testimony to this subcommittee uh, are to be sworn. May I please ask you to rise? And raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you'll be giving before this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, your entire written statement will be entered into the record. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, however, uh, during your oral testimony, in which you'll summarize that, uh, the green light before you in that little box indicates you have five minutes to summarize your statement. The yellow light means uh, that you have one minute remaining to complete your statement, and the red light indicates your time uh, for remarks has ended. So uh, we'll proceed with, uh, with the testimony. Let me first offer uh, brief introductions of our first panel of witnesses, who, again, I, I appreciate your attendance. Mr. Pat Patrick McFarland was nominated as Inspector General of the Office of Personnel Management in 1990. As Inspector General, Mr. McFarland is responsible for pro providing leadership that is independent, nonpartisan, and objective, and is dedicated to identifying fraud and mismanagement in programs administered by the Office of Personnel Management. Mr. McFarland is also a member of the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency. Ms. Susan Hayes is the founder of Pharmacy Outcome Specialist, POS, with 28 years of experience in the health consulting and management industry. Before founding Pharmacy Outcome Specialist, she was a vice president of marketing for, Sys for Systemed Pharmacy, Inc., and vice president of marketing for Walgreens Healthcare Plus. Ms. Hayes was the national practice leader for William M. Mercer, Incorporated, specializing in prescription drug auditing and bid procurement amounting to over $1 million annually in revenue. Our next witness, Mr. James Sheehan, has served as New York State Medicaid Inspector General. He has the, been the Associate U.S. Attorney for Civil Programs in, Eastern, in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Mr. Sheehan has focused on health care fraud since 1987, having personally handled or directly supervised over 500 health care fraud matters. From 1999 to 2006, Mr. Sheehan led the federal government's investigation in a case against Medco Health Solutions, which resulted in the recovery of over $155 million, as well as substantial business changes to protect patients and pharmacists. What's that? <clears throat> Already, uh, I'm being asked to uh, uh, vote having no other members here that might be able to uh, do this while I, I vote, I'm going to have to uh, ask you to just hang in there, uh, relax. I'll be back uh, momentarily. Thank you. We're in a brief recess. Thank you. 
How you doing? this panel through or just make sure everybody stays late? Cause that they, cause normally, they it depends on the issue. Yeah, because they don't want to mess up everybody. Right, but this is the important one. It is? I mean, this is <laughs> what he's asked us to formulate your most questions before. Um, I will say, though, that one of his good friends is on the panel, so... Oh, is that right? Yeah. And he has box seats to like to put Ha! Lynch Lynch does? Yeah. Well, that's good. We all can do a couple offices
fights the personnel. Yeah. 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 Uh, this hearing of the subcommittee is now uh, reconvened. We will hear uh, of each of our, from each of our witnesses. Uh, Mr. McFarland, you are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, and members of the subcommittee, good afternoon. My name is Patrick McFarland. I am the Inspector General of the United States Office of Personnel Management. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify at today's hearing and especially for recognizing the significance of pharmacy benefits manager contracts and their lack of price transparency in the context of the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. I am pleased to be appearing with my fellow panelists. Mr. Sheehan is particularly well known to my office as we had the privilege of participating in a number of health benefit fraud cases, some of which addressed instances of wrongdoing by PBMs that he conducted during his tenure as the Associate United States Attorney in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. We found both his ex expertise on these matters and his leadership in complex high-value cases to be unparalleled. Similarly, key members of my staff who are responsible for auditing the Federal Employees Health Benefits Plans and their PBMs have attended training programs conducted by Ms. Hayes's firm. They speak very highly of the training. The FEHBP is the largest employer-sponsored health insurance program in the United States. During calendar year 2008, the 266 insurance plans under contract to the FEHBP provided health insurance coverage to approximately 7.7 .7 million persons representing federal employees, annuitants, and dependents. The Federal Employee Benefits Program paid a total of $35.9 billion in premiums to these carriers. As reported to OPM by FEHBP carriers, pharmacy costs reflected more than 25 percent 
of health care costs paid by the fee-for-service plans. According to data furnished by OPM's contracting office, 12 different PBMs provided services to one or more FEHPP plans during 2008. My office has been addressing PBM issues from both an audit and investigative perspective since 2003. We were initially concerned that the health and safety of persons covered by the FEHBP may have been placed at risk by certain practices of PBMs. As a result of our timely law enforcement efforts, we addressed and resolved these concerns without direct harm to FEHBP covered persons. At this time, we have no information which suggests that PBMs under contract with the FEHBP are operating in a manner that would compromise the well-being of covered persons. However, the prior violations are a strong reminder that the potential for safety risks to subscribers exists through poorly written contracts, lack of adequate industry oversight, and the need for additional internal controls. Currently, in my office's estimation, the single most important issue involving the PBMs is that their contracts with the FEHBP carry carriers are not transparent and do not reflect the actual costs of drugs to the PBM. My office is committed to providing the oversight needed to protect the integrity of FEHBP and the integrity of its enrollees. Thank you again for inviting me here today. I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. McFarland. Uh, Ms. Hayes, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch and members of the Subcommittee on Federal I'm Health. sorry, Ms. Hayes. Could you pull that microphone directly in front of you and just make sure that it's on? No. Is that? Sounds, sounds like it. Okay, you thank you. To. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch and members of the Subcommittee on Federal Workforce. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify in front of you and answer your questions this afternoon. Um, my name is Susan Hayes, and I'm a principal with Pharmacy Outcome Specialist. In preparing my testimony today, I examined the problems encountered by federal and state governments when, when contracting for pharmacy benefits. I see three major issues. Let's take these issues one at a time. The pricing of prescription drugs is overly complex and hidden to purchasers designed to confuse plan sponsors and in turn disadvantage plan sponsors in the negotiation process. Prices of prescription brand drugs are based on discounts off average wholesale price or AWP. The source of AWP pricing is primarily two pricing guides, um, which may charge as much as $25,000 per year to subscribe to to obtain AWP prices. AWP prices may change on a daily basis and are complicated by the fact that a single drug may have over 50 prices due to different strengths, package sizes, and manufacturers. As a result, plan sponsors such as OPM have to pay exorbitant amounts or high auditors such as POS, to determine if they have been charged correctly in accordance with the discount arrangements with their PBMs. Prices for generic drugs are even more secretive. Each PBM sets a MAC list, maximum allowable cost, which is closely guarded, which is not routinely given to clients, and for which auditors must sign stringent non-disclosure agreements to obtain. MAC prices may vary by the day, the pharmacy, or between clients of the same PBM. In fact, each PBM may have over 50 different MAC lists. Auditing this, these prices are complicated, even for the most experienced auditors, and impossible for plan sponsors. Contracts between PBMs and plan sponsors, even the largest plan sponsors, such as OPM, do not adequately disclose when PBMs realize revenue, and as a result, disadvantage plan sponsors in the negotiation process. In a recent decision, the First Circuit Court of Appeals observed Quote, the health benefit provider often has no idea that a PBM may not be working in its interest. This lack of awareness is a result of the fact that there is little transparency in a PBM's dealings with manufacturers and pharmacies. Um, essentially, these contracts do not disclose the following. There are additional monies or margin, perhaps as much as 5% of the drug spend, that are retained by PBMs. Two, often as much as 50% of drug manufacturer rebate payments are never passed back to plan sponsors but are retained by the PBM. PBMs come up with different names for these rebates, such as cost-effectiveness rebates, formulary rebates, and market share rebates, 
and then the PBM determines how to divide up the pie of rebate and retain what they want and pass back to plan sponsors what the PBM thinks, thinks that the client expects without the client knowing that there is more. Three, patient drug histories and phys physician prescribing patterns are routinely sold to drug companies for profits by PBM without physician, patients, or plan sponsor's knowledge or approval and without compensation by the plan sponsor or, pa or patient. The lack of transparencies in PBM contracting is exasperated by PBM's resistance to disclose this information, dis disclosure of public information, even when the disclosure is required by state sunshine laws. For example, one PBM has brought at least 11 separate lawsuits seeking to block the release of its contract covering public employees in Texas, even after the Tex Texas Attorney General issued legal opinions in each instance stating that the PBM contract at issue should be released as a public document. Contracts between PBMs and plan sponsors limit plan sponsors' ability to audit these contracts and dis disadvantage plan sponsors from verifying if contract terms are met. Among the most insidious of these terms is mutually acceptable auditor. For Caremark, Medco, and Express Scripts, who together control a majority of the market, a mutually acceptable auditor may be one that is not experienced with rebate contracts, AWP sources, or PBM policies and procedures, or ones that are too expensive for most plans to afford. Representative Lynch, um, Chairman Lynch, I was surprised to see that your invitation letter to me um, stated that federal costs for pharmacy benefits are 30% of total health care spending. Normally, I would see pharmacy costs as 20% of total health care, and I would conclude that your program is really no deal. Um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that the government will reform its contracting processes in the upcoming rebidding of several FEHBP plans, and I'm asking for the following measures. Full transparent contracting for PBM services, pricing terms that are clear, AWP brand pricing information becoming readily available to plan sponsors, and PBM forced to publish MAC pricing for generics, rebate payment sources and types of rebate payments received by PBM fully disclosed, data selling of any kind associated with health care product spending or pharmacy data should require the explicit approval of plan sponsors, physicians, and patients, and that the plan sponsor's selection of a qualified auditor should not be routinely thwarted by PBMs, and all plan sponsors should have the ability to fully um, audit all aspects of the PBM contract. Once again, I thank you for the opportunity, and we'll entertain any questions you have. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, you now have five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak to you here today. Uh, I also want to join in, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with uh, Inspector General McFarland, who I've dealt with on a num over a number of years and is a leader in the Inspector General community, both on professional standards on these prescription drug issues. What I'd like to talk to you about today is my two experiences. One is in doing health care fraud cases with the Inspector General of OPM, where we were looking historically at what had happened within the OPM program and ended up recovering close to $300 million from the companies and requiring major changes in their business practices. And the second set of experiences in New York State, working with a unitary system where we have one payer for prescription drugs and one database that allows us to look at what's going on with the patients across the board. And I guess like a lot of your witnesses, I have a five-point plan, which I'm going to do in four minutes. Uh, the first part is, it seems to me, OPM needs access to and a plan for use of integrated patient claims data, which includes drug data. We're going to talk today about costs and pricing, but the most important information about prescription drugs, in addition to their cost, is what happens to the patients who take them. They experience better outcomes. They suffer adverse events. What's the cost of the patient and system of those adverse events? If you have these things parceled out through your uh, whatever number of plans it is, several, over 100 plans, you're not going to have that data available to do the kind of analysis to see what the benefit is to the patient, what the potential harms are, and what kind of costs you're incurring for the drugs themselves and for the adverse events. In New York State, we are a national leader in Medicaid data management, and in fact, most of the state attorneys general who have worked on the drug cases have used New York's data as their gold standard to see what's actually happening. The same opportunity exists with, the, with OPM could be the gold standard in terms of data. OPM is a lot more experienced with drugs 
and drug payments than any other agency in the federal government, with the possible exception of DOD. Um, the second issue is to take a look at identified drug risks, and there's, there's data available to do that that's laid out in my, my, uh, my written comments. The third issue is focusing on drug pricing. Um, drug pricing within OPM's health plans was based during the time I was working on reviewing it uh, upon percentage discounts off of average wholesale price, known in the trade as ain't what's paid, and negotiated by the experience rated plans with relatively little OPM oversight. The net prices that we saw OPM paying significantly exceed the net prices paid by state Medicaid programs, by DOD, and in certain cases, the programs which are run by private companies like uh, HMOs. And it, it didn't appear there would be a reason for that. The federal supply schedule, as you'll hear later, works very well with DOD and could be used in the OPM context as well. The fourth issue that I'd like to focus on is coordination of benefits between OPM plans and Medicare Part D plans. Uh, at the moment, there's, there's one of the issues that we've seen in New York is you have to go very carefully to look at what since Medicaid is the payer of last resort, in certain circumstances OPM may be, uh, who has first responsibility for these charges and what kind of prices should they be charged? And the, we began in the last year to obtain access to billion payment information from those PBMs. I know that DOD is doing the same thing, and OP, OPM has the same potential. That's, we've seen it's a, it's a significant dollar potential to recover, and also what happens to the patients is they end up they may end up missing out on the donut hole if it's properly treated. The fifth issue that I would focus on is one Ms. Hayes raised, which is the choice of auditor and access to subcontractor PBMs. Uh, when you have 120, 100 plus plans, very hard to audit all of them. And when I was working with OPM on the contract side, it was very hard to figure out who the specific plans were, what specific subcontractors were used in each case. And each contract was different, so you needed a different auditor with a different set of information, and they were very aggressive at attempting to block certain auditors who were knowledgeable from looking at the program. Um, when I look at these programs I, with OPM, I believe there are significant opportunities for cost savings on prescription drugs through improvements in OPM operations and a consolidation of the, P, of the PBM contracts that exist. And as important, there are opportunities for better patient outcomes, more appropriate prescribing, and reduced adverse events through integration of medical claim and diagnostic data with pharmacy data maintained by the PBM subcontractors. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. I now yield myself uh, five minutes. Uh, let, me, let me ask, uh, we handle... Uh, the purchase of our, our acquisitions through uh, DOD and, and, and other entities much differently than we do uh, the purchase of uh, pharmaceuticals. Why, maybe, maybe this is uh, naive of me, but why wouldn't we just make the purchase of, uh, of uh, pharmaceuticals subject to uh, the normal uh, regulated acquisitions process. Well, this that is, a matter of fact, one of our suggestions that we are able to do that. We we have we have certain proposals that we that we offer. One one would be, of course, uh, probably the the fastest and the uh, far short far short term at least would be to uh, have the federal regulation changed. In, in the uh, FEHB Act, uh, have to be by Congress, of course, so that uh, the uh, the uh, FEHB, P, excuse me, the uh, PBMs would be considered subcontractors rather than providers, uh, because they're right now they're they're really in concert with uh, a doctor or a uh, uh, small pharmacy. As a, as a provider, and in in fact, they are multi-billion-dollar corporations that are that are operating in a manner that we think would would be certainly reasonable to have them considered a subcontractor. And by virtue of doing that, then we we we'd have the transparency that we need, and we'd have the detail. We we get as close as possible to the actual cost. But, but short of that, 
that's that's the situation. Okay, Ms. Hayes, any thoughts on that about uh, funneling this uh, payment system and, and acquisition system through the federal acquisition regulations? Well, I agree with Mr. McFarland and his position that these prices should be available to OPM and the federal em employees. Um, again, I think that even if AWP average wholesale price is used as a basis, I think AWP pricing should be available to the public so that um, AWP information can be monitored routinely um, rather than having it so secretive and having it be bought and, and really not have this information available. So I, I agree that, uh, you know, uh, federal uh, employees should get the same pricing as DOD and other government agencies. But it, even if that isn't taken, I think that AWP and, and certainly MAC pricing under generic should be available to the public to understand what those costs are. Yeah, Mr. Sheehan? Uh, the, the difficulty that we encountered was that it was a requirement for a statutory change, and uh, that w did not appear to be likely to happen in the near future in the last, the last five years. Okay. Uh, let's see. I still have a minute and a half left. Uh, in trying to dig down and, and, and understand this whole process, it is just, it's unbelievable. The, the complexity, the needless complexity of, of this whole system, it's, it's, it's built to thwart oversight. It is built to uh, introduce as much complexity into the system as it possibly possibly can. It's a, it's a scam of major, major proportions. There's no reason that this health plan should have to operate like this. It is, it's a disgrace. And in this day and age, when we're trying to save billions of dollars for, you know, to, to fund this uh, health care reform, this is an area that absolutely has to be uh, cleaned up. This is, this is a mess. It's, it's shameful what's going on. And uh, it's going to take a while, but we're going to get to the bottom of this. We're going we're to change the system, I promise you. So uh, that's about all I have for time on this uh, pass, but uh, I will gladly recognize the general lady uh, from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and what a find you have before us here. Uh, we're just trying to understand, I'm trying to understand just as you are, how we could have taken this route. Um, let me try to cut to the chase, Mr. McFarlane. If you were looking at this system, uh, wouldn't you have to conclude that OPM simply patterned its own uh, drug program for federal employees on what the federal government was doing in the private sector? Isn't this simply uh, a um, – isn't this simply the attempt to recreate what that program uh, – in how that program was structured. To recreate the private sector? The program for non-federal employees, the bill that we passed, was it 2004? I'm asking whether this is not simply an imitation of or does not this program simply is not this program. If you look at it in large outlines modeled on that program, well, my feelings about that, Ms. Norton, is that in, in 1959, when the Federal Employees Act, Federal Employees Health Benefits Act was passed, it was very, very clear, very concise as to what was expected of OPM. Basically, OPM has, has uh, stuck very close to, to that. And, and not tried to go outside of any any uh, reasonable bounds, in as much as well. They let me let, let, let me challenge you on that. If in fact um, uh, the FEHBP um, uh, or or let me ask you. Um, whether or not 
this program is modeled on similar programs already in the federal sector, like the program established for decades now for veterans. I mean, wasn't there a clear precedent as to how to go about doing this? That th what the Veterans Administration is doing uh, seems to be a very expeditious way of doing it, and that is one of our suggestions that we might want to look at, at operating from the... Well, I'm challenging you, Mr. McFarland, when you said all they did was try to follow what they've been doing. Uh, it seems to me what the Veterans Administration uh, is doing is, is more closely related to what one would have expected of the federal government. Here we had a brand new humongous program. You look for, the first thing you look for is, do I have something to guide me? Here you have a federal agency that's been doing it forever. You put that aside and proceed. I don't understand why that precedent was not relevant. Uh, Mr. Sheehan? Yes, ma'am. Do you believe that precedent uh, had anything to do, should have anything to do with what was, 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 was happening here or was was there no was there no analogy between the veterans program and this program? The uh, we explored the veterans program and the uh, the Medicare Part D program and the OPM program. I think that uh, Inspector General McFarland is correct that what has happened is that the model that was used was the private sector model. But even if even at the private sector model, that is you know the, for major companies was what it was in 1959. Many major companies are doing a better job now in identifying these costs and controlling them and, and dealing with them than, than we are in the federal government. Well, I recognize in. this, that you look at the, our, our we deal, oh, FEHBB deals with individual plans right. and they, they do the negotiation. I don't remember people coming back saying they would, weren't getting a good deal. Uh, is the reason that they don't come back and say they're not getting a good deal uh, because of oversight by OPM? Uh, Mr. McFarland. Well, we have not had this complaint, so far as I know, uh, 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 among the FEHBB um, health programs that you say is the model for this program. Well, we, we in our office exercise our audit and our criminal investigative uh, efforts in, the, in this regard all the time. This is what we do the most of uh, in the, in the health care that services the federal government. So. I'm not, I'm not quite sure the best way to, to answer your question because our, all of our efforts are going towards resolving these conditions, and we have our options and suggestions that we are providing to OPM for consideration. Well, and we, we appreciate your work, and if the chairman will bear with me for just one more question. I'm trying to uh, – we understand we're trying to, 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 to see what is appropriate for oversight here for the agency to do. For, I don't recall hearing of complaints about people who were pressured um, to move from one uh, insurer to another. Now, there have been complaints that large um, nationwide pharmacies, whom we appreciate normally, because of the economies of scale that go back to the consumer. But yet, in this situation, there have been complaints of um, uh, 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 quite uh, unusual, at least in the federal sector, um, actions, such as uh, pressure uh, to move one's prescription mm -hmm. from uh, a pharmacy to the larger pharmacy. Um, I don't recall that in FEHBP we've had that kind of uh, situation to occur. And I wonder if uh, you have seen that and what you think of that and what can be done about it. Well, certainly when the uh, health carriers uh, negotiate their contracts with the PBMs, uh, that is in, in fact what, what they're attempting to do is to get the best price for the for the prescription drugs, and they are they but are. But the reports are that in some cases, um, the cost to consumers have has risen uh, significantly. Uh, there wouldn't be any complaints, sir, if 
the same kind of economies of scale you get from mega stores were available here. Well, but I, there have been complaints, and I'm trying to find out why, uh, why it, since we've not had that, and you say this is pattern on what we've done for FEHBP, I'm trying to find out what went awry here and what we can do about it, because this is new in that system as far as I can tell. Well, first of all, what it would take would be a, a Congress to amend the FEHB uh, Act uh, so that certain things, such as you're suggesting, can can happen and there can be more. So you would recommend of scale. that? Yes. Yes, sir. That's Ms. one of our Ms. considerations. Ms. Yes, Ms. Hayes. Um, I, I would recommend that. I mean, one of the things that you asked was, is this uh, patterned after private industry? And a lot of my clients are private industry. One of the things that private industry would never do is divide up their negotiation power over a hundred different contracts. OPM divides up their negotiation power over hundreds of different contracts through health insurers to the PBMs. And private industry would never do that. Private industry would use whatever leverage it had with its number of employees with one given PBM. Why don't they do that, Mr. McFall? I mean, isn't that really economies of scale? You know, you, you, you're the biggest player in the market. Uh, that's what you've got going for you. Uh, that's why good. aren't you using that strength? Why aren't we using that strength the way the Veterans Department uses that strength? Well, Ms. Norton, the, the situation as, as I see it is, is somewhat simplified, and that is that from the beginning, in 1959, the FEHBP has operated by not going outside of bounds. They have a certain prescription of, of not prescription, that's, I don't want to use that word right here, but they have a certain uh, uh, clarity that they're trying to stay within those bounds as far as dealing with, with uh, providers. They basically don't do that. They, they have contracts, OPM has contracts with the 266 health carriers at present time. And, and the health carriers then devote their time negotiating contracts with PBMs. PBMs, in turn, negotiate their time with- Mr. Chairman, I won't take up more time, because, but I, I, I do want to say, your testimony then is you do not believe they had the power to do that? It, I mean, I can understand. Are you saying- well, they do not that have the power That they do not have Congress. the power to do what the Veterans Administration does, use the leverage of the federal government to reduce the cost to federal employees and that if we want that to happen, we should change the law. Is change that your the testimony? Law, our, our OPM can, can do the federal regulation change. Uh, well, that is a very important or. That is a very important or, Mr. Chairman. Or if OPM was interested in looking at the system a brand new system for us, in terms of getting the best deal, they do have the regulatory power yes. to do so. Yes. yes. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Uh, let, me, let me ask, uh, sort of following up on uh, uh, Ms. Holmes Norton's question, we have a plan that uh, represents 7.7 .7 million people. A lot of buying power there. Uh, in your own experience, uh, do you feel like we're using that leverage to demand the best deal? Uh, sort of the, the title of this hearing, deal or no deal, are, are we getting a good deal, Mr. McFarland, do you feel, based on the leverage that we should have with 7.7 .7 million participants and the position that we have? We are concerned, Mr. Chairman, that we probably are not getting a good deal. There's a good chance that we are not getting a good deal because of the lack of transparency. And when I say lack of transparency, I want to be more specific. We, we can't find out information such as uh, the incentive pay, uh, rebate pay, volume discount pay, uh, administrative fees. We can't find that information out because we can't audit that. It's not right. available to us now. 
Uh, we, we can do that, though. We can carve out something from, from the uh, FEHBP, specifically the prescription yeah. drugs. We can carve that out and go after that, and we have then a tremendous amount of enrollees to make a difference. You're, you're correct. Yeah. Um, do you want to comment on that? Or, look, it's very difficult to conduct an audit on this system. I'm talking about professional auditors going in there because all this stuff is so opaque and it's been made so complex. There's been a deliberate attempt to build a system that is not auditable. And they've basically created that. And that's a frustrating, uh, very frustrating situation here. So I guess in this hearing process, what I'm trying to do is to figure out whether we can introduce transparency on the existing system or simply blow it up, blow up the system, put them under the federal uh, acquisition regulations, whole new ball game. Because I'm tired of this, this going on where our auditors can't go in there. I can't even figure out, I can't get information on what these drugs uh, are being, uh, the costs of manufacturing it, what their markup is, uh, where the rebates are going. They're not, you know, you would think that the, the, the end user, the entity that actually generates the usage and uh, the volume of these pharmaceuticals would earn the rebates themselves. I, I think based on the evidence we've had in uh, so far, about 50 percent of the rebates go somewhere else. Maybe they go to the PBMs or, or to some other groups, but they're not coming back to these federal employees, and that's, that's totally unacceptable. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether it's better to try to fix this system, and I'm not so sure it, it is because it just, uh, you know, the complexity is there, and uh, it may just take too long to – to do some of these things. It may be better to just simplify things, get it into an existing system, and, and let, you know, let it all shake out there. And that system requires the transparency. Uh, you know, y your own thoughts, Mr. McPaul? Yes. I, when I answered before, this is exactly what I was getting at when I said it, it will take a, a change by the Congress. And we can, we can uh, carve out something. Uh, that could be done, but it would it would take uh, a, a change. I mean, an amendment uh, from the from the uh, Congress. What what we also can do is a, a you know the uh, the FAR regulation could be done by OPM, and they could they could do that and allow us to get into as an example the federal supply uh, uh, area yeah. and and take advantage of it like DOD does and the Veterans Administration. Uh, Public Health Service and uh, the, uh, the Coast Guard. Right. The one of the other uh, frustrating parts of this is this, you know, the average wholesale, wholesale price or the MAC, the uh, mm -hmm. the uh, average cost, maximum average cost, or allowable cost, maximum allowable cost. Uh, it's tough to dig down and figure out what the the hard numbers are in terms of what we are being charged, 7.7 .7 million uh, members, beneficiaries. But I do have the ability to compare system to system. And when I look at the VA system that I'm involved with, uh, it looks like they're getting a discount from the average wholesale price of about, on average, maybe somewhere between 55 and 65 percent. That's the discount I'm seeing at the VA. Now, I got 7.7 .7 million employees who are federal employees, and I'd say the average discount they're getting is around 12 percent, maybe 12 to 15 percent, somewhere in that range. Now, I could understand if there were comparable discounts here, if one was at 45, the other one's at 55, but going from, you know, from 60 percent to 12 percent, uh, it, it just, I don't know, it just, uh, it amplifies, I think, the sense that, that the federal employees are getting a raw deal on this, on this plan. Um, I've, ex I've exhausted my, my time. If I could allow you to answer, though, there's only a few members here, so I'm sure everybody will be given ample time. Uh, Ms. Hayes, do you have anything you'd like to, you know, in terms of that whole issue, comparing system to system, 
Uh, you've got a lot of experience in this. I thought your your testimony, your written testimony, was very powerful, and uh, I thought it was you know you spoke very plainly, and uh, actually the little bit of testimony from the professional side, other than you three, that I could actually understand, and I appreciate that. Um, your 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 sense of whether or not. Uh, there's a way to drill down here and, and get this system into one of fairness on behalf of the federal employees. Well, again, you know, with what Mr. McFarland said, you have over 200 different health insurers subcontracting to over 200 different PBMs, maybe not 200 different PBMs, but under 200 different PBM contracts. There may be just a handful of PBMs involved, but they all have different contracts. And again, that creates chaos. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, you may have one contract um, that has one different list for generic drugs, and a, another contract contracting with the same PBM, they may have another list for generic drugs, and they're all on different pricing. I agree that if it, if OPM got federal pricing, it would give a level playing field. I think the other issue is transparency and disclosure. You've got to understand pharmaceutical money that passes back between drug companies to PBMs, back to plan sponsors. And that whole process needs to be 100% transparent in my mind right. and as a taxpayer. That has to be 100% transparent. I agree. And money is being kept by the PBMs on your behalf that should be going back and making those prices close to the federal pricing. That's why you have a difference between a 12% discount and a 50 to 60% discount with the VA. That difference is in part rebate money that is not being passed back. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, same question. Uh, any? I, I look at this system and I compare it with New York system, and I do believe when you when – you, first there's the, the breaking down into the 200 separate plans, but the second piece is between the PBMs – and the federal system, there's yet another set of players, and that's the health plans. And in the absence of OPM saying this is what we expect, this is what we want, this is how we're going to pay, they have their own interests as an organization. So what, when, when we did our investigation of Medco, we found there were significant dollars changing hands from the, from the drug companies to the health plans and from the PBMs to the health plans uh, in ways that didn't show up in the reporting to OPM. Uh, so there's a financial interest in these plans, which is their own, which is separate from running an experience-rated plan where you just pass the cost through. And so it seems to me that they have to take – they should take control of the process, whether it's going to be a federal supply schedule process or contracting across the board. That's an issue for the Congress to decide, not for us. But I think by letting it just happen, you're missing out on the opportunities at two separate levels. Well, there might have been a day when we could afford that. Uh, that day has long since passed, and we've got to we've got to try to maximize our savings here. Um, at this point, uh, I'll yield, uh, Mr. Cummings, would you like five minutes? Okay, uh, Ms. Holmes Norton for five minutes. Okay. All right. Well, I've got more, I've got a lot more questions uh, in my own mind. L let me let me uh, the, the problem the problem at the the uh, the pharmacy benefit manager level uh, is so complex with the, the the markup on the drugs themselves, the handling of rebates, whether they keep them, whether they give them to the end user, the employees. It seems to be a very mixed bag. And, and again, the level of complexity uh, goes not only to the drug manufacturer but also very much to the uh, PBM or pharmacy benefit manager. Do you think it would be – now, I haven't tried to really grapple with those entities uh, on a one-to-one, hand-to-hand -hand sort of basis, but do you think that maybe uh, a PBM Accountability Act or some type of, pen, you know, pharmaceutical benefit – uh, manager accountability act where you require transparency you require those entities to operate in a in a an open and uh understandable manner uh with their with their clients and and so and and open themselves up to a 
an auditing process so that we can understand what the heck is going on at that level. Mm -hmm. Chairman Lynch, if I could take a crack sure. at that. Um, I've investigated, I think, all the major PBMs over the last 10 years. And to some degree, the problem is that, that PBMs are like Larry the Cable Guy, that you may get a great offer on today, but when you think by the time they get the box in your house and you have to sit and wait for them, switching is very difficult and there aren't that many places to switch to. So the question is, how do you make sure that the PBMs do what you need them to do after the contractual relationship exists? And it seems to me that's a classic situation for regulation by, by Congress and by, by outside entities because you're not going to be able to negotiate in the contractual process because your clout, once the contract starts and you've got X million patients or X 100,000 patients in the system, is very little. You're saying, and I'm just trying to test yeah. your, your answer there, you're saying let's use the rebate situation. Uh, if we mandated that, that PBMs pass on their, the rebates to the end user uh, or, or, you know, 80 percent or 90 percent or something like that, uh, that they have to pass those back. Is that the type of – when you say you've got to tell them how to operate? It gets more complicated than that, and there are contracts like that. The difficulty was about 10 years ago the, the company started to do that. And what happened was everything that used to be a rebate got called something else. So it was a data ah, fee. Right, it was right, a, right, you know, right, right. it was a thank you very much for visiting our, our facility fee. So part of it is making sure that in the contractual process that, that there's a regulation that says here's, here's what the expectations are and here's the minimum floor you have to meet. Because otherwise, if you're a PBM, the trick is to, off, like Larry the Cable Guy, to offer stuff on the front end. And yeah. then you're in the relationship, it's very hard to find out whether you got it, which is why the regulatory process is important. Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Hayes, did you ha have something to add on that? I, I do. Um, as Mr. Sheehan said, you know, once you get into the relationship, that's when the auditors come in. And auditors have been thwarted by the PBM industry in every effort possible to make sure that the contractual obligation that the PB PBM has to its plan sponsor, to the, to the client, is actually being up, uh, upheld. For example, when we go in and do rebate audits that do not involve litigation, um, when we go in, we have to go there and copy down every single line of every single contract with a, between the pharmacy benefit administrator, the PBM, and the drug manufacturer, um, be, because I'm not sure why, uh, even though we're under very strict confidentiality rules, um, we have to copy down every single line of these very complex contracts. Some of these contracts are five, six inches deep. Yeah. And so for us to copy down that times 80 uh, contracts that they have with drug manufacturers, not being able to take those to our offices and being able to audit them in a normal manner um, that one would expect an auditor under confidentiality agreements to do is very burdensome. And because of that, Plan sponsors neither have the ability or the, the human resource ability or the financial ability to actually conduct these audits. So PBMs go into this contracting um, mode and they will contract, like Larry the Cable Guy, I love that analogy, they'll go in and contract what they think the clients will expect, knowing full well that the plan sponsor will never have the ability to actually audit these agreements properly. Yeah. I agree. I've only had limited uh, experience with a, a couple of the health benefit plans that I that I had worked with as an attorney, but uh, it seems as though uh, many of the, the the contracts are structured in a way that, uh, by virtue of their density and length, they defend themselves against the risk of being read uh, by anyone. <laughs> Uh, or let, understood. Let, let alone an auditor. Uh, I almost think, and you know, I, I think that the auditing piece here is problematic as well. And just reviewing uh, what has gone on and the, the idea of the audit and people understanding the value in that, there's also been a very, I think, concerted effort to, to either compromise the auditors or um, mystify them and, and bring in folks who really aren't equipped or, or uh, able to 
conduct a, a valuable audit. And so they're, they're often frustrated in their own efforts, and they end up giving a rather favorable uh, review, probably with the hope of getting more auditing work. So it's, it is almost as if we need to clean that system up as well and have certain parameters to make sure we're getting, uh, we're getting lucid and, uh, and thorough audits on, on these, these audits that we do request. And I know there's been a game played with the contractual language uh, of mutually agree, agreed upon uh, auditor which has frustrated many of these plans in getting an auditor in. Uh, sometimes these delays can go on for a couple of years where the parties can't agree on an auditor because, you know, the drug companies or the, the PBMs uh, are taking advantage of that language. But uh, I don't want to uh, monopolize the time. Uh, Mr. Conley from Northern Virginia, you're recognized for five minutes. Um, I thank the chairman, and um, forgive me for coming late. I've been on the floor for a series of fascinating votes. Um, Mr. Chairman, without, uh, I would ask without objection that uh, my opening statement be entered into the record at this point. Without objection. I thank the chair. Um, and um, let me ask um, uh, our panelists, um, do you agree with the OPM Inspector General's suggestion that the lack of transparency is a fundamental problem with PBM's acquisition of prescription drugs. And uh, did you encounter similar problems with PBM's changing prescription drugs at pharmace pharmaceutical companies' behest or PBM's overbilling FEHBP carriers? Are those fair criticisms in your view? Pat, why don't I – let me take one of those that I think we have addressed, which is the issue of switching prescriptions. Um, both Medco and Caremark, through its advanced PCS subsidiary, signed agreements in 2004 and again in 2000, 2004, 2005, agreeing to limit the switching activity that they would engage in. Um, and I would defer to my colleagues OPM as to the compliance with that, but I think it's been, it has been pretty good. That's not universal throughout the industry. Um, so that, that piece, I think, has been at least addressed in the short term through, through, um, through uh, litigation. The second piece, though, which is the transparency on pricing, I think is still a huge problem. And as we talked about, that the transparency on pricing issue is still a huge problem, in, and Ms. Hayes has talked about the audit side of that, but it's, it's a problem just across the board because it's very hard to figure out whether it's the retailer or the mail order pharmacy or the PBM that is responsible for making sure the transparency occurs. Ms. Hayes? Um, well, I would agree that transparency is a huge issue. I, uh, Ms. Hayes, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Um, I would agree that transparency or lack thereof in this industry is a, is a huge issue as to why costs are increasing. We have talked about the fact that rebates from pharmaceutical manufacturers through the PBM to the plan sponsor are not fully disclosed, and as a result, Plan sponsors probably aren't getting as much as 50% of the rebates entitled to them, which would indeed lower cost. So that's a, a large issue. I think the other uh, large I'm, issue is – I'm still is, having trouble hearing you, I'm, Ms. Hayes. I'm sorry. And I, and I know that's an important point you're trying to make there. We're not, a, we're not realizing 50% of the savings because of why? Because rebates between drug pharmaceutical companies to the PBMs to the plan sponsors are not being passed back 100%. And that's the reason. Um, so I would agree that transparency is a, is a large issue. I would also say that drug pricing and how complex drug pricing is. As I said in my opening testimony, um, a single drug, a single brand drug, may have over 50 different prices depending on the manufacturer strength and package size of that drug. Generics are even more mysterious as far as pricing. The actual PBM itself. So in OPM situation, you have 200 different, you know, PBM relationships are setting those prices. So the PBM has the ultimate control in plan assets by setting the generic pricing under these MAC or maximum allowable costs. And those MAC lists, they consider proprietary, and not only are plan sponsors never given those lists, even auditors under 
non-disclosure and confidentiality agreements have a hard time getting those to audit against those lists. Those lists change daily. The pricing cha changes daily. And so it's very hard to hold anybody accountable to drug pricing. So for me, transparency and lack thereof, I think, is a, is a big issue of why prescription drugs are increasing in cost. Right. Mr. McFarland. Well, I think uh, the, the best way to describe it is, is uh, let me give you the scenario that, that I have in front of me. It's very simplistic, but it goes to the heart of the, of the problem of where, where is the money and who's got it. A drug manufacturer, a, a pharmaceutical company, sells a drug to a wholesaler for $1, just using that as an example. This sets the whole wholesale price at $1. The wholesaler, wholesaler sells the drug to a dispenser, either a PBM or a pharmacy. But in this case, let's say it's a PBM for 70 cents and charges back to the drug manufacturer, the pharmaceutical company, 30 cents. So now they're made whole. The pricing in the PBM contract with the carrier is the wholesale price minus a 15% discount. FEHBP pays 85 cents for the drug, but the PBM cost was only 70 cents. And apparently it's all legal, but it, it stinks. I see my time is up, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. If, if we were to, uh, in fact, uh, classify uh, PBMs and or pharmacies uh, as subcontractors subject to the federal acquisition regulations, I'm trying to think that through. Would, would that, in your opinion, uh, solve the the transparency and and cost issue in itself, or would that would there be other downstream no. problems that I need to deal with? I'm just trying to think this through. It, it would be it would be very beneficial if if that were the case that it could become a subcontractor. Uh, that would simply uh, be that the federal acquisition regulations would Im impose strict oversight by virtue of being there. But also the Truth in Negotiations Act, the, uh, the law which protects federal government and the uh, taxpayer from unscrupulous contractors, that would be in play also. So it would be, it, that would be very helpful. And n no law change would be needed. This, this would be something that... Uh, OPM could do by, by changing the uh, regulation. Very good. Very good. All right. Um, yeah. Excuse me. Can I add something? Sure, absolutely, to that? Mr. McFarland. Uh, what I uh, forgot to, to mention was that that would not necessarily uh, guarantee that it would be a cost uh, type contract. We, we would have to work with, with that aspect of it. But in the uh, Federal Acquisition Regulations, it gives you that, that uh, possibility of, of uh, approaching that as a means of, of uh, conducting your business. So right. that's, that's what would be needed. Okay. Okay. That's, that's very good. That's very helpful. I, I appreciate that. Uh, let me ask, um, I've been sort of, I guess I was assuming in my mind that in a simplistic way that the people who actually uh, well, the end users of these programs are the ones that are entitled to, to the rebates. Uh, that was an assumption I made, and I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, does the uh, Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan have a right to the rebates? Uh, well, they, yes, they, they do have a right to the rebates if, if it's written into the contract between the PBS or P, P, PM, excuse me, PBM, excuse me, PBM and the uh, and the health carrier. Okay. But even even in that situation, uh, 
the great majority of rebates, we believe, are, are maintained by the, the uh, uh, PBM. Okay. If, if Please, Ms. Hayes. add to that, the, the, it's like the definition of what is is. It's the definition of what a rebate is. And um, PBMs have been very careful in saying, okay, you get 100% of the rebates. But then there's other money that they receive from pharmaceutical manufacturers that aren't called rebates. They're okay. called cost-effectiveness rebates. They're called formulary rebates. And I think the most egregious is data selling fees. PBMs sell data to pharmaceutical manufacturers and get lots of money back for selling data. That money is typically never passed back to the plan sponsors. Those aren't considered rebates. So again, you need to have a broader definition of rebates. In contracts that we write, we call them financial benefits. All financial benefits that a PBM receives from drug manufacturers needs to be passed back. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, you, no, I appreciate I could, that. Mr. Sheehan. The one other piece of this to focus on, though, there are two kinds of plans. There's the experience-rated plans where the money does, if it's, if it's paid by the PBM, the plan in theory comes back to the federal government and the program. But in community-related plans, my understanding is community-rated plans that the rebates don't come back. They're negotiated by the plan, and the, the, that entity gets to keep the benefit of, of that population. Okay. Uh, Mr. Connolly, would you uh, like to get five minutes? Uh, I thank the chair, and I, I'd like to return to the previous dialogue we were having. Um, are the PBMs, I mean, is the PBM system more trouble than it's worth? Is the PBM, is the use of PBMs more trouble than it's worth? Are you asking me? I don't care. Anyone uh, who wants to answer. I, I think PBMs. Who feels like pulling that microphone real close to them and answering that Okay. Um, I feel that PBMs provide a very valuable service. And they do um, provide a, a very valuable service by going out and contracting with 55,000 pharmacies across the United States by operating mail order pharmacies and providing plans a needed mechanism um, to process and and pay prescription drug claims in a very efficient manner. But they've been allowed to run rampant. They've, they've been allowed to take that very good initial idea that was formed back in the 70s and 80s, and they've been allowed to kind of run without control. And I think that's why you get at the issues of AWP prices going out of control, MAC prices being their own invention uh, for generic drugs, rebates not being passed back, auditors routinely not being able to audit contracts. So initially they were a great idea, and they've just been allowed to uh, kind of run on their own. And, and if I understood your previous uh, uh, answer, Ms. Hayes, uh, from the previous round of questioning, uh, they're actually withholding some of the savings from the prescription negotiations, the negotiated price of prescriptions for federal employees. Is that correct? That is correct. And then secondly, they're not only doing that, they're cloaking themselves in secrecy with non-disclosure agreements. That is correct. Even, even requiring, if I understood you correctly, government auditors uh, being, not being able to sort of penetrate that shield of secrecy by making them also agree to such non-disclosure agreements. Is that correct? I'm not sure about government auditors, but I know private auditors really? are routinely not allowed to audit these contracts. And, and I would just say to the chairman... Um, and I thank him so much for having this hearing. I, I, I think this is a very significant point. If one of the most important things this Congress has to do in the context of government health care reform is to get our arms around the cost of health care. Uh, it's, you know, it's one of the fastest growing costs for the American <laughs> consumer and family, for small businesses, for large businesses, for the federal government itself. Our deficits, our quality of life, um, our GDP, we're spending 18% on health care today uh, of GDP. Uh, if we do nothing by 2025, it's going to be 34%. Unsustainable. And, and yet we've got mechanisms in place that, frankly, uh, significantly impede our ability to get at those costs if we can't penetrate that secrecy shield and uh, ensure that we have access to the savings we're effectuating through the system we created a number of years ago. So I really take your point. It was 
an efficient mechanism of delivering certain services, but it's gotten out of control. Mr. McFarland or Mr. Sheehan, would you care to comment on that? I, I think that uh, th this is an issue that Pat and I have worked on for the last 10 years, and we think you're exactly right. That uh, I'd agree with Ms. Hayes that the, the, the system of processing pharmacy claims is a, is a major advance, and the, the PBMs have done it very well for a number of years. And you think about going to pharmacy and getting your prescription filled and, and billed within three seconds, that's a pretty amazing system. But the issue is how much secrecy exists and what kind of disclosure takes place and it, it, I'll do my Larry the Cable Guy thing again. It's when you got that box in your house and you're stuck with it, what, what can you find out about what's, what you're being charged for and why it is and how you could do it less expensively. And before we hear from Mr. McFarland, if I could follow up, Mr. Sheehan, is that an area where you believe this Congress legislatively could perhaps help? Absolutely, absolutely, because it's regulation of a relationship after the relationship exists. Since, since we're looking at comprehensive health care reform, what the heck, maybe we could look at this, too. And, and especially with, o, with OPM and, and a government program. Yeah. Mr. McFarland. The, the, the PBM concept, I think, is terrific. I think it, it, if, if done, uh, you know, correctly and honestly, uh, it would be a tremendous program. So it, it's not going to take a whole lot other than making everybody honest. That's, that's a big deal, of course. And we're, we're uh, certainly working towards that end. We are in the process in our office of doing uh, a new study. We believe it's going to be new in the federal sector. We think we will be able, by virtue of, of this analytical review, we will be able to come awfully close to uh, understanding the, maybe not the exact cost of the, of the prescription, but we will be able to make comparisons with DOD uh, veterans, uh, public public health service, uh, Coast Guard, we will be able to find out what the comparisons are there. So that that will be a start for us. But I I'm in total concert with with what both Miss Hayes and Mr. Sheehan have said, and that is that uh, it's, it's it's very good, but we we have we have some real real groundwork to do. Yeah, it's hard for me to I'll just finish with, hard for me, the federal government, to know whether I'm saving money or not if I can't, if I don't have access to the information. Well, that, that's exactly correct. And just you know, going in and doing an average audit uh, by our auditors in our office is a very difficult task. But it's almost insurmountable to go in and try and do an audit of a, of a PBM. Insurmountable. Uh, I think a Another example uh, would be that a health carrier uh, a while back uh, was was negotiating a multi-year contract with one of the PBMs, and part of the deal was that the PBM would get some additional money if the enrollment increased. Well, guess what? The time came, enrollment did not increase. So what did they do? The health carrier and the PBM sat down and renegotiated the contract, got the money, turned to OPM, and OPM paid it. Mr. Chairman, I, I just end with this. Uh, to hear the Inspector General of the Office of Personnel Management say to this committee that it is almost insurmountable for his auditors to be able to access this information in doing an audit of the PBMs is an astounding statement, and one I would hope this committee and this Congress would find, not a reflection of you, an unacceptable situation that needs to be addressed. I thank the Chair for his indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, at this point, uh, we have covered the landscape, I think. However, uh, beginning with Mr. Sheehan, I'm just going to ask you if there's some area of, of this that we have not thoroughly mined, if we haven't really uh, dug into this, um, I'd like to give you at least two minutes just to uh, focus on any areas where you think, if you think we've covered it all, then that's fine. But if there, you think there's an area where uh, you, you could amplify or, or just uh, single out as being very important to this process, 
please, Mr. Sheehan, for two minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the focus that I would leave you with, in addition to the very good points that have been raised so far, is to be conscious not just of the price of drugs, but what the effects are of the drugs that are given to patients. And OPM really does not have the ability to do that now because these contracts are so broken up into small pieces. So it seems to me one of the issues that OPM should be looking at is what is the effect on patients of the drugs we're buying and how can we integrate that with other data that we have? So what we're doing is being a prudent purchaser across the board. And when you're talking about close to 30 percent of your total spend on health care is drugs in this program, that really becomes a critical area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A great point. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Ms. Hayes. Well, if I could just summarize some of the things that we've talked about today. Certainly a single contract for OPM um, would, would benefit rather than the splintering of over 200 different contracts. Simple terms, simple terms that the layperson can understand and that the auditor can audit uh, would, would be very beneficial um, and, and not, you know, complexity, needless complexity. Um, disclosure of where the money is going. We've talked about rebates. We've talked about AWP pricing. The ability to have any auditor that is experienced being able to audit these contracts, uh, I think, is something that is needed. And I would also say that um, while it may benefit OPM to get federal pricing in the federal employees program, I, I worry that that may increase for private industry the cost of prescription drugs, that it would be Sorry, when you say federal pricing, the federal supply schedule? Yes, the okay. federal supply schedule being um, applicable to OPM. I hope that that does not increase for private industry the cost of prescription drugs. I hope that's not made up. And again, I feel that that would be accomplished if AWP and MAC pricing could be published um, so that plan sponsors do have an idea of what pricing is out there. So again, that's, that would be my recommendations. Thank you. Mr. McFarland. Well, just, just to wrap up, I think the uh, important thing to, to concentrate on for us, other than getting to the, the bottom line price, is, is realizing sometimes that the, what we have to do from a criminal investigative perspective and, and audits, uh, looking at some of the corporations that have gone astray, uh, such as what has happened in the past with some of the PBMs. When, when there has to be a, uh, a, uh, a caution given, given to the corporation that uh, they have to agree to ethical standards and that they have to provide their employees with appropriate training, I think that that leaves you with a very clear impression of how, how easy and how fast a, a company can go astray. And that's exactly what happened in a couple of the cases that uh, Jim Sheehan and, and our office ha has worked together. It's, it's just mind-boggling, the things that, that have taken place. When you consider that, that uh, the, the PBMs would actually switch drugs and not – not really care about the patient. Or when a, a patient sends in a prescription and that prescription goes in the waste can because, or gets shredded because they, they have a certain accountability for how many, how many they're going to do that day or that week. That, that kind of stuff is unbelievable. But, it, but it's here. It's in front of us. And we have to, we have to deal with it. It's, uh, just dispensing prescriptions with, without uh, uh, talking to the doctor and getting permission and the cost to these people. Uh, so there's, there's an awful lot to the overview and the oversight of this, of this uh, concern. And I know this isn't that unusual from maybe other corporations, but uh, it is a big problem, the, just the ethics alone. Thank you, Mr. Parlin. I want to thank you. I, I, just for the record, I, I know that we've got several hearings going on right now, plus we've got issues on the floor. Uh, I'm going to allow uh, any member of the committee to ask you questions in writing, and I would just ask you to respond to them uh, as well as inform the committee of your answers. Uh, but with that, I want to 
Uh, thank you for coming before the committee today. I want to thank you for your willingness to help us uh, work on this problem. It's an ongoing uh, process, so uh, we, we hope that you'll continue to work with our officers as we try to devise some legislative and regulatory solutions to the problems that we've described here today. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.